Welcome to American Architecture Now. I am Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and with me today is the distinguished architect, Charles Moore, famous for his whimsy, his exuberance, his work's lively color, as well as his colorful life. His houses and public buildings have been described as among the most important small-scale architectural works of the last decade. Charles Moore's schedule is as enterprising as is his architecture. A frequent commuter between coasts, not to speak of continents, he practices with his former firm in Connecticut and with the Urban Innovations Group in Los Angeles. He is the former dean of the Yale School of Architecture and currently the program head of architecture and design at UCLA. At the same time, he is a visiting professor at Yale this semester. In addition to all of that, he is the author of several books, including The Place of Houses and Body, Memory, and Architecture, books whose premises I hope we can explore this evening. A warm welcome to you, Charles Moore. Thank you. You've been crusading for quite some time now against so-called orthodox modern architecture. For years, you've told both students and colleagues that the Puritan Revolution is over, that they should design for popular taste in harmony with the dreams and hopes of the people, not their own elitist visions of perfect form. What do you think about the fact that these days almost everyone seems to agree with you? I'm not sure that everybody agrees. The, um, or maybe it, it uh, is because I keep sloping farther and farther toward uh, uh, what I regard as better ways of getting uh, people's uh, visions into into the work that we produce together. I'm all excited these days about uh, uh, participatory buildings. We're doing a church and have lately done a park um, in which um, the, uh, the people for the parish in the case of the church and the community in the case of the park have in a series of workshops uh, designed it with us and I'm very proud when it in each case, I've been told that um, they've never run up, up against an architect who, who so little inserted his images and so much um, welcomed theirs. I assume and you're referring to the St. Matthew's Episcopal Church and Pacific Palisades, yeah. where groups of parishioners were involved in the decision making. The whole parish. The whole parish. Um, it almost is contrary to the old saw that all of us are familiar with, that nothing was ever created by committee. Did you have an experience to the contrary, and how did the parish react to this group process? Um, they reacted, well, let me back up. The, we were hired uh, partly because we were among the few architects they could find who were willing to accept in our contract the requirement that two-thirds of the parish uh, would have to vote in favor of the, the design. This is a parish, a very elegant Episcopal parish in Pacific Palisades that uh, had never been known to agree on anything. And they had just finished having a terrible time agreeing on, on a, a new uh, rector after the one of 30 years had retired. And so trouble was expected. But what happened was that when we started working um, in a series of workshops, it's not not like, well, there were also committees, but not like a committee telling the architect what to do, but rather a series of people with us helping in an avuncular manner to, uh, um, for them to come at the, the images and the visions that, that they had about the church, which turned out to be very strong, and turned out to be uh, in remarkable um, agreement of uh, consort. Uh, uh, we got finally a month or so ago an 83 percent vote in favor of the of the church that we had all been designing together. People would sit around at tables of um, 10 or so, 10 or 10 to 15, and make a scheme, uh, and then there would be maybe seven or eight of those those schemes, and it would turn out that they were all very much the same. So. Uh, each time, to our astonishment. So it, it was a, a way of having, I'm not sure it would always happen, but it, it, um, it happened there that, that the church we got was 
was the church that was on the minds of, of most most of the people involved. There were a few who didn't like it. I and mean, how close it was it to the minds of the architectural firm involved? We have no mind. Of the, <laughs> uh, never mind. <laughs> never, no, never mind. It makes no never mind. Uh, uh, one of the things I think that's urgent about operating in that way is that uh, that the architect can't have a, his mind made up about about what the thing is going to be like before all this starts, or he's just going to be in, in constant conflict with uh, with the people who are who are forming their own minds. I care a lot about it and have been doing all sorts of things to it um, as an architect um, in the months since it was uh, was um, since the scheme was arrived at, but. Um, I, uh, one of the, the, the rector congratulated me after a particularly hot and heavy um, evening when some ancient lady was seeking to tear me to pieces. Um, and I was smiling and thinking how lovely this nice old lady was tearing me to pieces. And, uh, um, and he expressed amazement that I, I never seemed to get defensive. Um, and I, I think that's the secret of making all that work is just, not to to be committed beforehand to some scheme that you feel obliged to defend, and therefore not to get defensive about anything until it comes out what what the people want, and then I guess it's a manifestation of my own immense ego. But I think I can make a nice building out of uh, out of anything that that um, that they come up with. It's so it it should be said that that all this process is a great deal different from the advocacy planning of, of the 60s, in which um, young architects um, and a few old ones uh, went in among the people to, to act as midwives for, for the people's visions. But it all, that all seemed to involve um, depending entirely on the shapes that, that the people themselves wanted to, uh, to make things or the ways that they saw them. And those shapes turned out, in many cases, not to be definite enough to produce buildings, so that advocacy process very often f fell afoul of, of that and, and just didn't produce stuff. We're, we're still acting as designers, doing things that we've been trained for that we can presumably do more efficiently and better than people who haven't been trained for them. So, so making the shapes is up to us, but they're the shapes that people themselves uh, tell us they they want, let, let me say, refining the shapes is up to us. And they define them? They, they define them and we uh, refine them. We do um, a Rorschach test with slides and um, the, the um, parish in, in Pacific Palisades, for instance, gave heavy votes in a series of 100 slides. Their best, their most votes of what they would like to see for St. Matthew's went to Alvar Alto's uh, church at Imatra. The church they would least like to see done for St. Matthew's was St. Peter's in Rome. You refer to 60s architecture as advocacy architecture. Some of it. And some of the new architecture has been called everything from pop to postmodernist, from conceptual to post-functionalist. What would you call it? How would you describe it? I can't think of anything suitably bizarre to say. <laughs> um, um, I'm, I'm fond of the people who made up the postmodern appellation, um, so I don't like to be sour about it, but um, it seems to me that, that the term uh, covers so many different attitudes from, uh, from the, the very architectonic ones of Michael Graves or Richard Meyer to the populist ones of people like me, that it's very hard to, uh, um, to derive much meaning from it, except that we're we're all interested in uh, in trying to, to make architecture more interesting by uh, by attaching to it uh, images and and uh, well images from uh, people's pasts, from people's memories that make it mean more than the pure forms of, of the last 50, 60 years. Um, so. I wish there were, you know, I keep saying that I would rather be pre-something than post-anything, and uh, 
and I wish they would find a, a, a another term for it. I don't much. I don't. I'd rather be paleo. I'd rather be <laughs> proto. Um, I'd rather be proto whatever it is we're going to do next. Um, I mean, what is that going to be? Oh. The point is, is the movement away from the glass box in this so-called revolution that is taking place, is it taking a form that you're comfortable with, or do you think that it's going in the wrong direction? Well, it's going in so many directions that it's very hard to say. It's, it's very difficult to figure out what, what any chief direction is. Someone pointed out to me the other day, and I had never realized it, that uh, uh, Siegfried Gideon's uh, Space, Time, and Architecture, which served as a Bible for a whole generation mine of architects when we were going to school, um, which covers some 500 years, has in it some 33 examples and bases a whole theory that we were all supposed to agree on, um, on those, those I'm sure not randomly selected, but certainly arbitrarily selected uh, uh, buildings that uh, that were very few out of millions that that people were building. So, so we've been brought up on a kind of what a colleague of mine calls mainlining, in which the or mainstreaming, um, in which the historian figures out what's the mainstream, and it might include the front of some building, but not its back. Um, you know, the architect was in the mainstream when he did the front, and therefore it's important, but when he did the back, because the door had to be off-center, um, he wasn't in the mainstream anymore. This is nuts, um, and um, is not a helpful way of, of uh, figuring out what to do next, certainly. It just doesn't lead toward helping us to figure out what to do. I think what's happening is, is that, uh, or what, what I hope is happening, is that that we're being uh, the bonds are being let up a little bit. We're being given a chance to uh, uh, to pull on many, many images from many, many places and uh, uh, to do them with the agreement rather than the, the passive submission of, of, the, of the people who are going to live in the places. And so I think I think whatever it is we're doing is is, is doubtless a Healthful. It produces some some just terrible looking buildings, I have to say. But uh, that doesn't. I don't think that uh, renders it invalid. You've been described very often as being not concerned so much with the appearance and beauty in an intellectual way, but rather than the comfort and pleasure in a sensuous or physical way of any structure. And many of your buildings, I guess, are known for looking more expensive than they really are. Uh, there was a quotation that someone gave me the other day by Ambrose Bierce, who once defined an architect as one who drafts a plan of your house and plans a draft of your money. A very contrary uh, procedure to the one that you follow. I'd like you to comment for us, please, on the relationship in your work between costliness and the appearance of costliness. Among other things, is that an attempt on your part to deflate pomposity? The relation is, is um, uh, complex. A, a friend, William Wilson Worcester, who taught, was the dean at Berkeley when I went there long ago, uh, whose wife said of his work, which was very very elegant, but very understated Bay Region shanty. No matter how much it costs, it'll never show. <laughs> um, and so I've, I've, I admire that way around as uh, as much as as the, the one you were describing. Although I have, haven't had very much chance to, to do the however much it costs, it'll never show. Um, I I've felt some kind of professional re requirement to. Uh, uh, and not to spend too much of people's money. I know that there are architects who uh, who give people pleasure. You know, the board of directors of the bank comes and says, "Mr. Architect, we have this cunning little two million dollar bank," and um, um, and the architect says, "You creep! Uh, how can you have a two million dollar bank uh, 
when you should spend, be spending at least 12. And they say, yes, sir, yes, sir. Mad people, yes, if we spend 12, will it be wonderful? And he says, yes. Um, and, uh, and they all live happily ever after. The, I just, that gives me the creeps. Um, and I've tried very hard to make things that, that didn't cost more than the people in question seem to think they wanted to spend. I think I've, I've missed a number of times with that premise that there are people who, uh, who have been very disappointed that they got a cheap house after they'd asked for a cheap house. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're also famous for the humor in your work. And that is, uh, I guess, you're one of the chief exponents of the building a sight gag school. I've often wondered who the humor is for. Is it for architects, for fans of architecture? Is it for the public at large? My notion about it is that, that well, I used to describe it in terms of, of buildings speaking, that uh, there are many voices with which buildings can speak. Of course, the words are put there by their designers and their inhabitants and everybody involved with them. Um, that um, it seems to me that, that during the last half century, the, the way buildings, uh, the language open to buildings has been drastically and catastrophically reduced so that, that they, they can only look like a savings and loan, which is regarded as the most dignified thing for something to look at, look like. Um, and um, and I, I'm against that. I think, uh, I think that, that we, uh, that buildings can and should uh, talk in, in different voices for different occasions and with uh, with different special circumstances that uh, uh, that there's no that there's no reason why they should in their desperate attempt to achieve dignity be be robbed of of uh, of that chance that doesn't mean that I'm for the 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 one-liner, um, and I think an awful lot of postmodern buildings that I object to are uh, are one-liners. It, it seems it's a lot. Sorry, I didn't hear the last thing. Uh, are one li like one -liners, like a one-line gag? You know, you you spend fifty million bucks and you build something, and everybody says, "Whoopee!" It looks like a fish, and uh, <laughs> and then then that's that, and. Uh, and everybody knows it looks like a fish, and and, um, and nobody cares again. I think that that any building uh, has to, uh, uh, whatever set of moods it's it's uh, trying to create, has to uh, to have in it lots of different um, sides, aspects, um, colors, um, emotional colors, so that. Um, that it means different things at different times to uh, to people. And I think that the the overall requirement of anything that people are going to spend money on is that it should be pleasant. It should be a nice place to be. It should be nice when the sun comes up in the morning and shines in the breakfast room, or 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 uh, when there's a chance for the view out over the water, or whatever. And uh, and I think that that we that the gag is. Is really not not very funny um, in architecture. The uh, the uh, the building all built to uh, to allow some writer for the architectural press to say something cute is uh, is not not worth the trouble. Well, let's talk about another innovation of yours. And that is, for hundreds hundreds of years until the modern movement banished them. Architecture used classical ornament systems called orders, such as the Doric order, the Ionic order, and the Corinthian order. With wonderful, I guess you'd have to call it playfulness, you have added something to the Vitruvian canon by introducing a new order. Of course, I'm referring to your invention of the delicatessen order for the Piazza d'Italia in New Orleans. Can you tell us something about that new order? Uh, we thought we were going to have a delicatessen in, in it, uh, which is why it got called that, but uh, it's going to be an elegant... That's another uh, spoof. It's going to be an elegant Italian restaurant instead. Um, the oh, people from... I didn't do that first. Um, uh, 
early 20th century architects and, and American architects, since there have been any, have been busy inventing um, column capitals with corn and uh, wheat and I suppose barley and oats um, and um, Indian spears and, and anything else they could think of that would be interesting to people to uh, to put them to put something people could relate to on onto their buildings and also cope with that difficult place where a vertical support meets a horizontal thing that it's supporting and so we just thought we'd we had this delicatessen, we thought, and uh, we, it, we thought it would be a delicatessen because it was at the top of the map of Italy, and we thought, therefore, it would be in some vague way Germanic with sausages in the window. And, uh, uh, <laughs> but not Germain. Um, uh, Germanic, but not Germain. Your um, Piazza d'Italia fountain in New Orleans was commissioned, as I recall, as a, as a celebratory space for the local Italian community. And you produced has what has been called a razzmatazz design, and one that has caused considerable controversy, as actually one might have expected when designing any public square that in a way resembles a stage set. Perhaps you might tell us about this design, how it evolved, and what it was that you were trying to do. Um, it is a celebratory space, and it seemed important to make it not like a savings and loan, but um, like something celebratory. Uh, in New Orleans, for the last several years, they've uh, local uh, ethnic groups, I guess one would call them, have uh, uh, have gotten together and, and um, supported spaces. Most of them really quite minimal. There's the Place de France, which is about five feet wide, but inevitably Joan of Arc in the middle of the highway. Um, and there's the Plaza de España with uh, <laughs> with a lot of tiles and a fountain, much bigger. Um, and I think there are or are about to be I'm Deutsche Platz and God knows what else. Um, the, the Italian community in New Orleans is, is, is very well organized with a bunch of, of, uh, of very influential uh, civic leaders. And um, And well, they are. <laughs> and uh, um, and one of them, um, one Italian civic leader, uh, gave the city a, a, a L-shaped piece of land at the bottom of a 23-story building that he owned um, as a trade for some other land where the city closed the street, which was valuable to him. So there was a site with some beautiful old warehouses on it, and they had then a. a limited competition, which we participated, which was won by a local firm, August Perez, and we ended up, I ended up as the the fountain consultant and, and second place winner. Um, and my my scheme had been a, a big sort of swirl, elliptical swirl of, of dark and light stripes that all crunched up into a fountain uh, to uh, uh, keep on going with the building so as not to uh, spend too much time contrasting with it and therefore looking at it, a very simple uh, modern building. We used a considerable amount of sophistry to announce that it reminded us of the piazza uh, di San Marco's Campanile, because it's tall. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, so we were meant to, uh, to make something Italian. The scheme, the winning scheme had a, a round piazza, which we kept. And uh, uh, the idea for a fountain that would, could serve as an alder on St. Joseph's Day, the day of the patron saint of the Italian community in New Orleans, uh, food is put on alders and then at noontime is given to poor people and children dressed as Jesus and Joseph and Mary um, uh, march around and give the food away and say things suitable to the occasion. And um, so that, that was going to be what, what we needed a big fountain for. And we said, what shape should it be? And well, it, what was the most Italian shape we could think of? Well, Italy. Um, and, uh, then, and then that 
And then we said, well, we can run the water down the Po and the Arno and the Tiber. That'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, those are the three fountains the three, that represent those three, the three rivers. The three yeah. rivers. And then we could have uh, it run into the Tyrrhenian and Adriatic seas where people could splash. Um, and then I said, oh, hooray, and we can also have tiki torches on Vesuvius and Etna. And they said, <laughs> no, we cannot do that for that is tacky. Uh, <laughs> Besides that, it's Sicily. <laughs> uh, also, it turned out that, that um, since 95% of the uh, Italian community in New Orleans comes from Sicily, Sicily had to be the, the middle of this thing and a podium for speaking and all. You can sit on Sardinia and listen to the Sicilians talk. And, uh, um, and so it would not be suitable to have a tiki torch under these speakers, and, uh, or at least so they said. Um, and so we we got stopped there, and then and then we all sat around and said, "We have to have more water than this. This is no fountain." Um, and one of us, I think, uh, I'm told I didn't think of Italy, but that I did think of the orders um, in the way we operated. It's impossible to know who thought of what. Twenty minutes later, um, and. Uh, uh, so we said we will have the orders, and then we invented some schemes for marching the orders across the piazza, and it hit Italy, and then we found some other way of, of pushing them back around so they wouldn't be in the way. And then we got to sit around for weeks thinking up things that, ways that orders could, could uh, uh, be made out of water with acanthus leaves made out of crunching a spoon around so that the, the water got and uh, the water rolling around uh, in uh, in the volutes of of the ionic capital and uh, little water up in Metapes, what they got to be called Wetapes, which is not <laughs> um, and uh, there was a, there got to be a lot of stainless steel in it, and so water rolling down stainless steel walls seemed to us wonderful. And I had a special place that I was very proud of. Uh, where the water um, on the Doric wall running down the stainless steel was going to be intercepted um, above the arches by by huge truck windshield wipers. <laughs> well, there must be another place that you're very proud but, of as well, and that is that on one of the walls there are a pair of heads that spout water, and those heads, whoopee, this time it looks like Charles Moore. That How did, did that come about? Well, my colleagues um, desirous a of not having those those um, truck windshield wipers, and which they thought were tacky, and um, of doing something funny, did all that, managed to keep it a secret from me until. Uh, That's Mr. They, Perez' homage to you. Uh, yes, to the two designers in the Perez office, um, did this bizarre thing. Uh, I immediately Paul. shaved off my whiskers so as to uh, avoid uh, recognition. <laughs> Paul Goldberger has called it the most significant public plaza that any American city has erected in many years. At the same time, he caught, said that it was a wild, mad vision, as if the Roman Forum were re-erected in Las Vegas. Is that what you learned from Las Vegas? I, I never learned anything from Las Vegas. But <laughs> I'm sure I should have, but, but it... <laughs> Um, each of us has a threshold of tackiness that we can't get. Uh, <laughs> beyond which you cannot go. <laughs> beyond which you cannot go. Well, your houses do not fit into any easily classifiable style. Often they remind one of collage, an assemblage of elements that are really not, rela not visibly related to one another, except that they come together, I guess, in their ability to please the client, and I assume the architect. The point that I'm trying to make is that one cannot quite say more when given a picture of something quite so easily as one might say Meyer or one might say Gary. Is this deliberate? Yes. Um, I think there's a straight answer. Um, um, I, houses are for the people who inhabit them. And um, I get much more pleasure out of trying to figure out what what they would what would turn them on, what, what uh, dreams and visions and images they're, they're hanging onto in their heads and then trying to, uh, to make those happen in some way that, that's full of uh, 
choreography um, of, of the elements that, that's interesting to people. And I get much more pleasure out of that than I would out of, of making my own set. I've, I've made six houses for myself, and that really is plenty to uh, try out my own images. And uh, I realize that, that my hand is evident in, in things I do, um, and I guess it couldn't help me. But I, I feel very proud when people say that I did not push them, but help them to get what, uh, what, they, what they want. What would you call your style if you had to give it a name? I think there are a couple of people writing some papers nowadays that, that call it all freestyle, which is, uh, I think, a good, uh, a good way of getting at the, some of the qualities. And many architects find it very helpful to, to, uh, to make a set of rules and, um, and then work within those. And, and uh, there have been lots of, of distinguished uh, people in, in all the arts in this century especially, who have, uh, Stravinsky's uh, Poetics of Music does a beautiful job of describing that point of view, of, of saying what, uh, uh, how the artist should, should limit and hone and, and uh, squeeze so as to, to, uh, to get the, the grounds for producing a great piece of, of art. And I, I think that's very impressive and I don't, I don't quarrel with that as something that, that uh, some artists and some architects can and should do. But I just get a lot more pleasure out of, uh, of the looser um, attempt to, to, uh, to put together uh, everything that, that's, uh, um, that comes to the project, the client's visions, the stinking little budget, the whole, the whole business. Some architects would empty spaces and you would fill them up, celebrating clutter and the idea that we surround ourselves with objects that we love and know the best. Among your best known buildings, and you've just described that you've designed six of them, are your own houses. I'm thinking particularly of the houses in Orinda, California and in New Haven. Perhaps you could describe for us the environment and some of the innovations you've created for yourself, but I'd like for you to begin by telling us what's a pyramid doing in a bedroom in Connecticut? Um, it's a compositional device with a message, um, which is what anything ought to be, I guess. Um, the message is he has favored our undertakings? <laughs> that's, um, Charles Jenks causes, calls these things double-coded. And since they're your um, work, you might describe it for us. Um, well, I had a, a room in uh, a, the the main room in my little house in, in Essex, Connecticut, uh, that had been a, a lawyer's office, I guess. It was dark wood and uh, big and um, under under the eaves, so it was uh, um, sloped it on the edges toward the top. And I'm not neat by nature, and it was both a living room and a sleeping room, and I needed some sort of, of uh, thing to hide the bed. And it seemed to me that it would be more interesting to, to have an object to hide the bed than just to have some grungy little little uh, thin wall uh, doing that. Also, that would let me have a closet, um, which was useful since there were no other closets in the house. Um, the, and um, it came over me one day when I was looking at one of my last remaining dollar bills that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that it would be a kind of endearment if I would um, hang on to that concept. Of, it wasn't Giza, but the dollar bill that inspired it. Oh, yeah, because yeah, the dollar bill has that wonderful Masonic um, eye over it, which was the thing I was really trying to get at. I never made the eye right. It, it should have glowed or something. And then, uh, <laughs> and then once I had a pyramid, then then I, uh, I had, so Olivetti had sent me a calendar that had a nice Egyptian pyramid with, with those little sort of ant farm uh, uh, burrows in it that um, took you down to the pharaoh's tomb. And I thought that would be nice to, to put some of my numerous objects in. And then we uh, mixed up the green, which was supposed to be the dollar bill green for the pyramid. and. Uh, 
and somebody said this this is not the green of the dollar bill this is the green of a watermelon and we all said whoopee we will now make pink on the inside and the, the, because it, one could carry oh, that metaphor well watermelon is much more interesting on the inside than a dollar bill is when you get right down to it and, um, your work is also known for its bold use of color as you've just described but super graphics as well and in that environment uh, there is a bold use of graphic material, of graphics. Would you describe that? Um, but the room was, was too dark, but it had beautiful dark beaded boards, and so we thought we have to paint some of this room white and leave some of it with the pretty dark beaded boards. And what can we do? And, and to, well, we already had the dollar bill pyramid, and so that was easy enough to uh, think of a new at Coeptus and all the things that dollar bills say on them, um, which caused quite a lot of ruckus because it's very hard to paint lettering on a ceiling if you haven't done it before. Especially in a circle. Especially in a circle. A real pain. Um, the, we'd been very much involved in, in, uh, in super graphics in the 60s as, uh, I guess it's not wrong this much later to call it a revolutionary gesture the, at a time when, when there was an attempt to change everything super fast and in our case anyway not much money well, the to purpose do that. of that device purpose of it was to uh, uh, to attack the super it seems to me real super graphics um, is uh, of the 60s um, is a painting in bright colors usually that just happens that um, it reflected the mood of the period, uh, that is meant to change your impression of, of a building or a wall or whatever the super graphics are, are on. And that unless it does that, it isn't, in my limited definition, uh, the super graphics that we were, that we were interested in. Um, the, that is, um, of shapes that are much bigger than the, the space that you're in so that you feel as though you're in the bottom of some room infinitely larger than the one you're actually in or, or something like that. It seemed to me to uh, constitute a genuine super graphics. Um, they were very interesting for us in the 60s and they let us do um, cheap remodeling on on places that we didn't have the money or nobody had the intention to uh, to deal with in more permanent materials. They let us um, uh, uh, put some excitement on, on very low budget public housing, things like that, that uh, seemed to us would benefit from the cheering up that the super graphics would give. But we don't feel ourselves ever needing or wanting to do it anymore, uh, now that it's the 80s, and even while it was the 70s, because the the whole desire to change everything drastically um, has, I think, passed away on everybody's part in favor of, of the, the expectation that things can be changed. If they're to be changed, it'll be much more effective if they're changed slowly, carefully, and, uh, and based on, on uh, at least in part, on such traditions as we have. I'm fond of saying that, that uh, I think architecture is most usefully seen as a, not as a composition of shapes, but as a, a choreography of, of the familiar and the unfamiliar, in which you need, you need to have the familiar to get people involved, to, to make people feel that it's theirs, and you need to have the surprising, the unfamiliar, to uh, uh, even to make the familiar evident, because people get very bored with, with the familiar and, and need the excitement of surprise uh, sometimes. But if you just blast them with surprise the whole while, it's somebody else's surprise and, and, and not illuminating, not, not, not useful. And Maybe you've shifted the ground of so your innovations rather than uh, the design and the defined, refined form to the nature of the process. I'm particularly interested in your interest in the participatory nature 
of the exchange between the architect and the client and what you have referred to as your own populist approach. One of the ways that is manifest and that I, one that I think of particular interest is the use of videotapes to interest people in urban design. How and where and under what circumstances and to what effect have you used that device? It's actually not videotapes but live TV um, in which in and we're in our fifth city now. Um, we uh, we roll into town for a period of months. Some of the people from our office open a storefront office um, to encourage people to come in and tell us about what they are interested in and the subject at hand. And Dayton, Ohio, it was a riverfront. And Roanoke, it was a Virginia, it was a downtown. Um, urban renewal space that was mostly torn down. We're doing a scheme in Watkins Glen, New York, now for a, a lakefront um, in a little town that has railroad tracks along the lakefront presently. But it's very, it's worthless, we think, for a team of architects to roll into a town and tell them what to do until the people there have been asked. They can't be anything but suspicious and generally angry. So we, we ask, and uh, Dayton was the first one in which we decided, well, mostly we were trying to think of some way to get the job away from Larry Halpern and RTKL, who were also trying to get that job, and uh, we figured they would think of most other things, but they won't, they'll never think of TV. Um, and, uh, and then we got hooked on it, um, and a couple of the people in our office in Connecticut uh, Chad Floyd especially spends most of his time now uh, organizing uh, television programs. The deal with the programs themselves, which they're usually a series of, is that we have um, usually a bank of six telephones and lots of notices in the newspapers and all beforehand on the radio um, to encourage people to listen and then to call in with their ideas and then we deal with it progressively from introducing the subject to what it's like there for people who haven't looked at it much to uh, uh, preliminary models to uh, more refined models and gives us a chance to act like architectural short order cooks and, and to move the models around and, and to draw pictures of what people call in and say they, they would like. And again, as in the, the parish in California, the Get 83% results get, there. Get an too, enormous amount of consensus. Yeah, the people. So the people know what they need and what they want is I what you're talking about. I think. Is. I think that there's much less um, conflict about what people want in a city than, or in a little town, or any situation, than architects have always chosen to believe. They, they don't. They aren't sitting there lost in a miasma of self-doubt and confusion waiting to be saved by some heroic architect. They're just, they're pretty close to, uh, uh, to getting it together, but, but somebody has to help give shape to it. It's, the shapes are inevitably complicated. Are you pleased with the results? And in Roanoke, they've, uh, um, they've raised um, by one means or another, including some public bonding, something like 33 million bucks since uh, since we did our our television thing several months ago, and uh, are building most of the things that they said they wanted to build in in the um, yeah. How close time. did their request come to your forethought? We didn't have any forethought. We didn't know what they needed. We were from out of town. Uh, we <laughs> well, if that's the case, why shouldn't a local architect? be designing and planning for them? Because um, in most cases we've been called in, not in Roanoke, but we've been called in when uh, when there was a, a groundswell of resentment against um, local architects because they seemed to be doing stuff secretly and uh, people thought that some way they were being had by uh, even quite beautiful things designed by local architects were were not seen as as meeting the needs of the, the people there. And so uh, we, we were asked, I think, not for, for whatever uh, previously organized images we might have, but for, uh, 
for our capacity to find out what people had on their minds. Well, you've been rolling into a lot of towns and a lot of cities and a lot of countries for quite some time. How important is it for an architect to travel, in fact, to travel so much? How important is it for an architect to collect memories and learn his history firsthand? I don't suppose I should, should make any, any cross-the-board pronouncements about it. I, I think well, this planet is just full of wonderful uh, buildings and cities and uh, parks and trees and, and various places. Um, and um, I think as part of the business I was, my increasing conservatism that I was earlier describing, the, the choreography of the familiar and the surprising, I think uh, getting familiar with with um, with a lot is a is is helpful and for me absolutely necessary. I can't imagine not running off to see something as soon as I heard about it. Um, but um, I'm sure there are people who have much better meal schedules and all by by staying put. The, so I, I'm not. I don't think I would like to recommend that everybody take off this very minute and roll around the world. But I would certainly like it if I could take my my history classes to the things in question rather than just showing those everlasting slides. What if any historical precedents impress you? In fact, what precedents do you use as models for your own approach to architecture? My favorites these days, subject to change always, um, are a trio of, of early 19th century architects um, who are no surprise to anybody. Uh, John Soane in London and Carl Friedrich Schinkel in Berlin and Thomas Jefferson on these shores. And they, I find them all very exciting because they, they were at once um, at the dawn of a new era, the Industrial Revolution, and they were all well, some less than the others, but both Schenkel and who was investing heavily in in iron works and Jefferson starting a whole new country. And so in investing heavily in acquisitions. Oh, it's, well, it's his little <laughs> lumpy rocks. Um, the, but still they were they're nice lumpy rocks. Um, and so is in some ways my favorite of the lot. Um, the, but these guys were all um, at once on the threshold of a whole new era. Um, about to do something, doing something exciting, uh, but um, but expecting that the past that they'd inherited and loved would be helpful to them in in facing the new era. They'd all had their uh, their grand tours, uh, Schinkel and Sohn to Italy and Jefferson to France, and um, and they they had picked up on on things they thought were wonderful that they could bring back, deal with, with dazzling freedom. Um, the, a sewn column capital has about as much relation to uh, to a Italian column capital as uh, as Richard Meyer has, has to uh, 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 those Belgian architects who uh, uh, put up the funny looking buildings. Uh, the, they were um, um, all of them would, would uh, could get the whole essence of of, um, of the classical past in one thin incision, and uh, and still not lose it, still not leave out the thin incision, and just go blank the way some of our more immediate predecessors seem to have uh, have done. Your work habits. Um are legendary as well. We've all seen, or many of us at least, have seen um, examples of ink sketches on cocktail napkins that have been drawn on airplanes. These ink sketches on cocktail napkins seem entirely natural with your now legendary peripatetic existence. How and where do you work? Less on the airplanes now because all the cocktail napkins are really crummy. The they absorb too much ink. <laughs> <laughs> and they have little patterns on them. Um, they're very hard to draw on. Um, 
I don't know. Uh, less and less. I'm going to remind you of the work you did while you were seated here. Splendid people who Charles are well organized Moore. bring along the drawings, and, and people who are not just do them. Splendid Charles Moore drawing of something that you created while sitting here for a work uh, that is in progress that I guess the rest of us will have the opportunity to see along about a year from now. In fact, it is uh, your work together with that of an artist. I wonder if you would comment and evaluate the nature and the level of collaboration that exists, as you see it currently, in general, between architects and artists. And perhaps you should restrict your comments to the period from 1945 to the present. Well, that, that'll be fast. Um, <laughs> Uh, it seems to me that that um, that while while architecture and art, painting and sculpture, uh, both uh, were uh, very scared of content um, of, of saying something specific, uh, that uh, the opportunities for the artist and the architect to collaborate were just about nil. That um, you know, the, the typical thing, as everybody points out, it was the Mies van der Rohe um, creation of, of some absolutely neutral grid in which uh, some wiggly thing by some artist or other could, uh, could be placed, uh, set off, um, contrasted. Um, in the past, uh, before 1945, and best perhaps in the 17th century, um, the, there were so many things to, to, to talk about, to do with buildings and with, with uh, sculpture and painting that, um, that they were natural um, cohabitors of the, of the same space. When you've got a batch of saints or, or uh, devils or, or uh, whatever rolling around in the building, I think especially of something like um, Bernini's Sant'Andrea al Quirinale where there are those kind of good-looking young, uh, full-size plus uh, cherubs up there. <laughs> um, the, it, it adds adds considerable uh, conviviality to the elliptical church. Um, and my hope is that, uh, that in the years just ahead, starting perhaps tomorrow afternoon, the, uh, that uh, as content returns, and I I hear both painters and sculptors as well, and architects too, announcing that it is, is doing it already, is about to do it some more, uh, then, then I think there will be increasing and exciting chances for, for architects and artists to, to do stuff together. I'm looking desperately for the, for the return of the figure onto the cornices of buildings and uh, um, all over the place. Well, if we have the return of the classical order, the column to contemporary architecture, can the figure be far behind? Well, the trouble is there aren't very many people know how to do them. Um, column capitals, at some cost, you can uh, pop together. But, uh, but I don't. We suggested to the people in New Orleans for whom we're doing a scheme for a federation hall for the Italian community on the piazza that our, the best part we could think of was to get um, some of the young people of the community to yank their clothes off and be cast. Um, and they were offended by this concept. Uh, any volunteers? Not a one, no, their, their elders uh, headed it off before, any, before it got anywhere. And we were seen as extremely dirty middle-aged persons. Who, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, there are more subtle approaches will obviously have to uh, be devised, but... Uh, Do you enjoy working with artists? Are you helped or hindered by such a collaboration? To begin with, most of the things we do are, are, are sufficiently cheap so that uh, uh, the, the, there aren't any more dollars left over for the fees um, or, or for, the, for the works. Um, but uh, I, I, I teach with, with sculptors and painters, uh, sculptors especially, and Is there a natural alliance that? between architects and artists as you see it? 
I don't think there has been for the reasons I've described, but uh, I think there, there should be, and uh, I suspect will be. Do you ever like to design a museum? I'd love to design a museum. We're doing one at Williams College, in fact, at the, the moment, which is very tiny, but... Uh, Isn't there a museum that exists there now? There's the Clark, yes. but, there, but the art, Williams College itself also has a museum, which is getting expanded. And it has a beautiful building from the 1820s, uh, done by some person who was 25 years old at the time, and octagonal, and we're adding on to it, which is great fun. If you, uh, if in fact, in that commission, what are your primary concerns in the design of museum space? Is it light? Is it space? Is it flow? Well, I, there are two things, that, two preconceptions that I bring to it. Um, after having said that I wouldn't do that to buildings, but in that case there are a couple. Um, one is that it seems to me from the museums I've been in, and God knows I've been in plenty, um, that that rooms are nicer than flowing spaces, that I would rather be in a museum with, with a series of, of uh, definable rooms in a definable order than in, in, um, in the kind of, of uh, limitless space that was popular 30 years ago and since. Um, I also feel strongly as an architect in favor of, uh, of the complexity of natural light. And so the, um, the whole issue architects like Alvar Aalto did so much with of, of uh, admitting natural light to, uh, to museum spaces without letting damaging sunshine get on the walls is, uh, is one that I'm fascinated by. But I think, I hate to be in museums where I don't know uh, where I'm, whether I'm ever going to get out. <laughs>